the following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, I'll try not to blast quite as much now that I have a microphone on. I am used to talking to the back of the classroom and keeping everyone awake, so microphone or no microphone doesn't really bother me. Uh, like I said, I'm Joni Julian. What am I doing here? What is my background? Um, well, I have a background in physics before I jumped ship into biomedical engineering. And I kind of jumped ship within biomedical engineering. Instead of sticking with the straight path, in my case on medical imaging, I jumped over into telemedicine and then said, ooh, this network management is far more fun than that. So my dissertation is actually on the intersection of internet, SNMP, network management in general, and quality of service, which, by the way, is a bad word around me. But I've got the numbers to back it up. And as one of my coworkers says, he introduces me. He says, this is Joni Julian. She has a PhD, so we call her Dr. J. Don't mess with her, she has numbers. Because I do come back with my nice charts and graphs, and this is why we do it this way. I've got the charts and graphs to show it. That leads me to the bad news, though. I'm in networking, not in security. So my goal is to build a network where I can shepherd all the little packets through. This whole thing about dropping packets kind of creeps me out. So I may be the absolute wrong person to give you a talk on security. That said, when I talk with our firewall person about why he's dropping certain packets, every time he goes through and, well, I dropped so many packets like this and like that, I'm sort of like, oh yeah, I want you to drop those. I just don't think that way. So apologies in advance for probably being completely unqualified to give this talk. I do know the networking side. So, if you look at me and say, I'm not running IPv6, I am going to look back at you and say, are you sure? It's on by default in most major operating systems. The only one I can think of where it isn't is Raspberry Pi. If you're running a modern operating system, it's turned on by default. It's running on link local. So that said, if you're in security, and you've already got the IPv6 turned on, or worse yet, your users have it turned on, you probably want to secure it. In fact, I really hope we all want to secure it. So let's get a little bit started with how are we going to do IPv6. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'll take it out of full screen mode so that you can see the URL I'm going off of. This is all available online in a couple different places. That's called redundancy, so I can walk in and poof, it's just there. But I have two links here on how to build your IPv6 network. Louisiana State University wrote a fantastic white paper on how they did theirs. And it included, we fell into this pitfall, and there was this booby trap over here, and we had to rework it several times. Here's how we got it right. So it's a fantastic white paper if you don't want to start off learning your lessons the hard way. Um, and then the one I liked was, don't have the plaid polyester leisure suit of IPv6 networks. They throw in some interesting thoughts on how to do your naming. You've got so much more address space available than you had before that they recommend you know, taking some of those bytes and making a, and after all, you will get in the habit of recognizing them, you know, this building gets this, you know, couple of bytes together, you know, so two words for the building, floor, something to make it easily identifiable, something to bring extra meaning. You've got the address space, burn it like you've got the address space, which is an interesting point since we don't think about addresses that way right now. Same thing for security. As I said, I am not a security person. 
we'll get into some of the details. I may be blurring it a little bit. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology has published guidelines for doing this. It's, it's a good overview to get you started with the language. This again may be because I'm not a security person. I found it looked like a good cure for sleeplessness for me. I liked the IPv6 security overview. The vulnerability concepts have not changed that much with the advent of IPv6. I think the most important thing you can get out of this talk is, oh, we have pretty much the exact same concerns. I just need a little translation chart. This is what I called it in IPv4. This is what I call it in IPv6. Everything you've learned is still valid. You might twist it a little bit. You might change your vocabulary a little bit. It's the same thing. You're ready for it. You can do this. A report on IPv6 security test methodology. We just went through a big firewall review process and had to figure out how to test these things, including for IPv6 when we don't have any experience with IPv6 firewalls. That's when it's really helpful. Instead of learning things the hard way and perhaps not having the feature we want, refer to somebody else's test methodology. And then here's another one uh, where Cisco has done a, here are the vulnerabilities, here's how to avoid them if you're using Cisco routers. Hopefully I don't have to comment much on this. Does anybody want me to go into why network address translation is not a form of security? The short version is to do network address translation, you have to keep that table of here's the inside address and the port it's using, here's the outside address and the port it's using. What is that when you have to keep track of this? That's called stateful. So when you do NAT, Yes, this one's awesome. When you do NAT, you've already got the statefulness track. They throw in a stateful firewall for free. What you want is a stateful firewall. But please, as a network manager who has to go troubleshoot this mess, the less NAT, the better. You throw in a NAT, and I can't troubleshoot my way out of that NAT. It's much worse than a paperback. Um, if you enjoy it, there is a YouTube video with a Nat fanboy. Again, I'll bring up the URL at the end. Oh, I forgot to mention one of my things about talks. I prefer to be interrupted when you have questions. Please feel free to interrupt me. That's the reason why I have slides. If I just go off of the slides and nobody says anything, it will put me to sleep. You don't want the speaker going to sleep. If you interrupt me when you have questions or comments, that will keep me awake. I like getting lost in the weeds, and then I go back and I look at the slides and I go, oh, yes, that's where I was. The slides are here so that we can go get lost in the weeds. You can interrupt me, and I won't get too badly off track. Here's one of my translation charts for you. What do we say in the IPv4 world? What do we say in the IPv6 world? Well, at a very basic level, we have ARP, nice little layer two, what's going on. You run the ARP command to see what's in your ARP table. It's not ARP in IPv6. The reason why it's not ARP is ARP is a broadcast protocol, and IPv6 does no broadcast. It will only multicast. So we have to warp, we have to find something to replace that functionality that doesn't use broadcast, that uses multicast instead. It's called NDP, Neighbor Discovery Protocol. If you're on a BSD box, you can do NDP-A in the exact same way. Uh, if you're on Linux, uh, IP Neighbor Show. So if you wanted to use ARP Watch for something in the IPv4 world, there's an NDP mon. If you want to run ping, but to a v6 address, it's ping 6, trace route, trace route 6. A lot of commands, you, for instance, nmap becomes nmap-6. The host command, dig command, goes from host and dig to host-6, dig-6. 
And then if you're used to IP tables, so you go, OK, so it's either ping, ping 6, nmap, nmap minus 6. I got the pattern here. I'll just try both of them. No, then they have to throw you a curve like IP tables and IP6 tables, because this time we need the 6 in the middle, because consistency is for smaller-minded people, clearly. Uh, Nancy's question is, is the output the same? Not always. Usually it is very similar. A lot of commands like netstat will now take a dash w flag, where w stands for wide. The problem is the v6 addresses are so much longer that they get truncated and you don't get to see all of them. So you also learn, not only do you want the dash 6, you might want a dash w in there. There's a certain amount of trial and error to figure out what's right. But I can almost guarantee you, if you run into a wall with a certain command of, you know, you're not showing me everything I need to see, there's probably another command flag for that. I've had to go back and make good friends with the man pages again. It's okay. I like my man pages. So the part where I am comfortable talking about what's going on is talking about the host firewall. I have IP tables running on a large number of servers, and I have IP6 tables running on a large number of servers. And the last time I went in and looked at how our IP tables had grown, I have a really good system administrator, but he is not a security person. And I went to a talk on IP tables, and I came back and I looked at what we were running, and I wanted to run screaming out of the room. You can't do that when you're the manager of the system. So instead, you sit down with, what do we have? Oh, goodness, why do we have this? I don't know. If I don't know why the rule is there, it's going out. And then came up with a nice, clean, consistent, we will be putting this IP tables on all of our machines. And we're not running IP6 tables anywhere. I'm not OK with that. So we will be putting this IP6 tables everywhere. So after I sat down and went through all of that, they're really almost the same. So I'm running a diff on the text files I kept on my computer because I need master copies in about a dozen locations before I'm comfortable. So I just ran a diff on these. Oh, and I asked for a machine I could beat up on. You will see in a later slide this is a VM. Uh, the machine I got was Moose. So everything will be running on Moose if I don't kick the screen down. So I've started adding some chains. One thing I decided to do was to put names on them so that I could remember what they were doing. Since I'm in the networking group, we have a VLAN for our servers. I've mangled the IP address. We have a VLAN for our users. And we also have a NOC that does a lot of monitoring. So I've got my servers, my users, and the other group that's monitoring us. We also do internal monitoring. Uh, TSM for backups, and then who are my users? This is basically defining inside versus outside. So who's at UNC with me? So we see I've had to iterate out a number of subnets for the IPv4 world. And in the v6 world, yeah, it's a lot more compact. Again, you've got all that elbow space, so you don't have to have multiple subnets. Uh, UNC has three class B networks and a handful of class Cs. I know. This is, I told you I mangled the addresses in here. But we have a lot of address space, and on the v4 side, it's very tight. Yes? I have a question. Why did you do slash 64? How come you did not do, um, like, every slash 24 make it a slash 64? Um, so that your servers, your users, and monitors are also slash 64 too? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. This, this is, okay. we're doing slash 64 for every VLAN. That's just our default. Every VLAN will be a minimum of a slash 64. If you can give a use case for needing more than that, we allocate more than that. We have done that. Um, libraries and iBiblio have larger allocations from us. And then for UNC, we actually do have a slash 47 or 248s if you want to look at it that way. But again, the real difference here, um, I moved from one address space to the other, and because the other has more elbow room, I needed fewer lines to define it. Not really scary yet. Yeah. 
So what do we have to change? Since we're in networking and we do a lot of troubleshooting, ping. Ping is my friend. So I definitely want ICMP turned on on my boxes. I've met with other groups where they don't want that. In the v4 world, you get to choose that. In the v6 world, you do not. Remember how I said we had to have a replacement for ARP that uses multicast? And it's the neighbor discovery protocol. That is a component of ICMP v6. You cannot blanket turn off ICMP v6 and have your IPv6 work. Can, can I say that's a good point? I feel that way about it, but I like to have a target and, okay, ping, answer, okay, this step is working, go a little farther out, go a little farther out. So I'm with you. I'm trying to be a little more moderate about it since I'm talking to a security <laughs> audience, and I know everybody else wants to drop my packets, and I'll try not to have a heart attack about that. Security through obscurity is not security. <laughs> Thank you. See, I didn't even have to say it this time. Security through obscurity. I'm going to go back to the slide with the ostrich sticking its head in the sand. That's not security. Just wait. So you do have to leave IPv6 ICMP turned on. If you need to go through which options and OK, we'll leave NDP working, go ahead. I'd rather leave all of it turned on, though. It shows up in so many places for crucial to how IPv6 works. Another one is the path MTU detection. IPv6 says there will be no fragmentation, so it has to have good path MTU detection. That's part of the ICMP v6 protocol. So lots of really cool stuff in there. It almost always works. When it doesn't work, I've usually been able to track it down to, why did you configure this router this way? Or more often, why did you configure this firewall this way? Please turn this option back on for me. So I can, again, troubleshoot my way out of the paper bag. Um, oh, right. Reason why these lines show up for my TSM backups, that's a v4 only server. Thank you or no thank you IBM for that. Other than that, almost everything is the same. The first place I was told to turn on IPv6 was on the campus name servers. And I went, oh, great. Uh, there's only going to be like 50,000 people who notice if I make these servers burst into flames. It went flawlessly. Nobody noticed. Except me, and I was over in the corner jumping up and down. Almost everything works exactly the same. No, no need for a heart attack here. Some things are different, though. I run the campus DHCP servers as well. DHCP v4 needs port 67. DHCP v6 needs port 547. So as soon as you get used to, oh, hey, this is just the same, you'll run into an application like DHCP where it runs the v6 on a different port. Just keep your eyes open for that. A few of those will jump out and bite you. And then I defined my um, DHCP server VLANs. This is the whole sum total difference between IP tables that I put on all of my servers and IP6 tables that I put on all of my servers. Not a huge amount of difference. So everything you know translates fairly painlessly into the world of IPv6. So big message now, don't panic. You can do it. Yes? Oh, you did have to go there. Robbie asked if I actually use the DHCP6 protocol. Um, Yes, very hesitantly. The problems with DHCP v6, uh, if I go too far down this rabbit hole, it's going to be very bad for my blood pressure. I hate what ISC has done with DHCP v6. Thank you. <laughs> and that's why I'm running it. Uh, as he said, there are some things you can only do with DHCP, and that's why I'm running it. I would say my biggest completely legitimate grief with ISC DHCPD is it doesn't do what it says in the documentation. One of those items where it does not do what it says in the documentation, I say through clenched teeth, 
is it says it will rotate its leases log for you. Now, it should rotate its leases log for you. Uh, that said, I've been known to get an alert that says DHCPD isn't running. And I go look at it, and the leases file has hit the two gig wall. And I say, hmm. I rotate the leases log manually, and the process suddenly restarts. If you say you're going to roll the log for me, do it. Don't put it in the documentation and crash and burn badly. And then this is where we run into another interesting characteristic. We're a university. We have some departments with more money than others. Let's concentrate on the ones with less money. And then let's think about printers, particularly the good old HP printers. In, and older. We have many. Yes, we have LaserJet 4. I bet I could find a couple of LaserJet 2 and LaserJet 3 on our network. <laughs> I, uh, yes, Robbie is recording me. Because they don't die. Yes, which is why I love them. The, the only reason why I upgraded from my LaserJet 2, this is a true story, I was trying to print some of the figures in my dissertation, including a nice little decision flow chart that was fairly detailed on when it was permissible to use QoS. And I think you'll remember from the beginning of the talk, I consider that a bad word. Um, QoS is a lot like NAT. I don't want either one of them on my network. I can design a better network that doesn't need either one. Please let me have that chance. <laughs> Good for them. Good for them when they go to troubleshoot it, too. So we have a lot of very old printers on our network. A lot of them don't have passwords on them. Yeah, I probably shouldn't say this when I'm being recorded. We get to have fun with some departments, though, when they get recorded for that. We'll change the password and see how long it takes them to notice. So far, no one has. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> now, one of the problems with old devices, after a while, the manufacturer stops making firmware for them, and they might not support modern protocols well. So it was our computer science department, as a matter of fact. And they actually do refresh their printers a little more often than some of the other departments. Old HP printers um, don't do IPv6 very well. The problem was they do a little bit of IPv6. And what it did was, once a second, ask my DHCPv6 server for a lease. Do nothing with it. Next second, ask my server for a lease. You get a couple dozen of those. And they did have a couple dozen of those, asking for a lease once per second. Now, remember that leases file that's supposed to roll every two gig? It was staying up for about six hours. <laughs> and I get tired of getting paged after a while. So then I, yeah, and we say, turn it off on the printers. So uh, that's some of the fun you can have. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. I will find out what model the printers were. <laughs> we can fix this. In this case, we fixed it by turning it off. There is another um, feature. This didn't actually hit my DHCP6 server. I'm just going to throw it in because it had some similar characteristics. Only instead of the frequency being once per second asking for a DHCP v6 lease, uh, these are Newer computers with Intel NICs. I don't remember which model, but get the new shiny thing with an Intel NIC, a new shiny Lenovo desktop. I think it was the M3. Whatever Intel network card comes with that. If you leave IPv6 enabled by default, it decides to do a neighbor discovery every 
microsecond. <laughs> 10 to the minus 6. So a million times a second, and I'm actually not exaggerating, one million times per second, it says, who are my neighbors? Who are my neighbors? Who are my neighbors? That turns into a multicast flood very quickly. <laughs> this is on link local. It's not enabled on the router on these VLANs where this has happened. It's just someone has decided to do their custom build, not the UNC recommended build, and it blows up. So uh, some of those things you might want to watch out for. Once a second, getting a multicast flood. Anybody know what the canaries in the coal mine are when you have a multicast flood? Yeah. What was I talking about before? Old printers. If you get your printers old enough, they're 10 meg only. And it doesn't take much of a flood, particularly when your end users are connected at gig and asking a million times a second. It doesn't take much to flood out a 10 meg only printer. They're the canaries in the coal mine. If we get a phone call and someone says, things seem a little bit slow and I can't print, or sometimes they say things seem a little bit slow, C can you print something for me to the oldest and slowest printer you have over there? If they can't print, there's usually some sort of flood going on. And we can look that up pretty easily. So fun little stories of how we can flood the network in new and different ways. There is a replacement to IP tables. I haven't sat down to go through it yet because my boxes are running Red Hat Enterprise Linux and they don't have the new kernel with NF tables in it. Net filter tables. It bundles up IP tables, IP6 tables, ARP table, and EB tables. And I can't tell you the number of times I've wanted to go, ooh, if I could just say this piece of layer two information with this piece of layer three information, drop it on the floor quickly, or... I am very much looking forward to, uh... oh, sorry. His comment was, and projection, uh, his comment was that the syntax for NF tables well, is semantics. semantics. Almost exactly the same as OpenFlow. So we can start to have a lot of fun with this. And I've always wanted to merge this, plus, what did I just spend two slides talking about? My IP tables rules are identical to my IP6 tables rules, except in the couple of little corner cases where I have to change it, where I'm talking about the address space or one of those applications where it changes. So wouldn't it be nice if I could just do all of my rules together, IP tables and IP6 tables? I think that sounds fantastic. But they had so much duplication in the code and got it so specialized it was one of those, we're going to start over with net filter tables, NF tables. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting to play with this. But that's new shiny. I haven't played with it, so we're going to the next slide. So what are our IPv6 security tools? We hadn't even turned on IPv6 yet when THC, the hacker's choice, released their IPv6 toolkit. And I was like, oh man, they got to the starting line before we did? This, this is not a good thing. So the first one, out the door, came out a number of years ago. Followed a little more recently by SI6 Network's IPv6 Toolkit. A little more in the testing realm than completely the hacking realm. And since I'm more into the, I don't want to blow up my network. I, I just built it. I don't want to blow it up. That is the package I'll actually concentrate on. And I looked at a lot of the tools and went, no, I'm not going to do a flood over here. No, I'm not going to do that. So my plan was to step through all of the tools to show you how they worked. And then I kept going, but I don't want to flood my network. So we'll go through the ones I found more benign. Because I like my network. Another tool from SI6 Networks is their IPv6 mon. It is an active probe to discover the IPv6 addresses. That's an interesting thing because that gives us a third or fourth tool 
to do the same thing, and they don't all agree on who's there. So you may want to use all of them. I yes. IPv6 mod? Yeah. I did not poke at it. But this bit about active probing, to me, says it's going to have to be on the local link. The question was, does IPv6 mon work on link local only? I did not look at it to be positive, but it almost certainly does. Because there's so much, there's multicast groups, and then everybody responds to it that only work on link local. So my guess is that it does, but I have not investigated that one. There's Scapy, Python tool. This is general purpose for build a packet. Build a packet that. Scapy is your tool. There's a firewall tester built on Scapy, ready to go. So if you want to roll your own, go Scapy. If you just want to test a firewall, try FT6 or the IPv6 toolkit. And then while I was poking around, I found Chiron and NDPmon. NDPmon is the ARP watch analog for IPv6. So we have other tools. And I, I teach a class on networking every spring. And I'm quite lucky. I often get students who are already very good at this. So I can learn from them. Recently had a student from the Army Signal Corps who taught me about Security Onion, how all these things had been packaged together. And just watching him jump from one application to the next to the next, and it was pulling along the same data, and you know, now let's analyze it over here. I was really quite impressed with that. Nice little all-in-one boot from this CD toolkit. There's nothing like that for IPv6 that I've seen yet, so bring your own duct tape. And this means you do need to have a goal and a plan for that. And that's where you can go back and look at the testing methodology link that I suggested. And now it's time for me to jump in and make some trouble. So like I said, I got a VM to beat up on, on Moose. I did have to disinstall libpcapdevel, and then just jumped in, grabbed the IPv6 toolkit. I don't install anything without looking at it first. So first I looked at it, then I installed it, read the readme and went, read the readme and went, oh. You know, there's not even a dot slash configure. So make all, boom. And all the commands were built right there. They all end with a six. So you can do this ls grep for what ends in a six, and you're there. Or you can cd to the manuals directory. Again, I did not install these in the standard directory. I didn't have the end man path. So I had to use nrof to meet them, read them. Yeah, I'm much happier on the Unix side than the security side. This should probably be clear by now. I like security, especially if someone else does it. The standard options for all of these tools, they all took dash I and an interface. They all had dash H for display help and a dash V to be verbose. These are good options to have on Unix tools. When you want to do something on link local, and as we were just talking, there are many ways to say, show me all my link local addresses, you know, all my link local neighbors. Well, the problem with link local addresses, what is localhost in the world of IPv6? It's colon, colon, one. So you can get, or loopback, I'm sorry. You have a loopback address on every single interface. So if you want to say, you know, ping loopback, you're going to have to give it which interface pings loopback or which interface pings the multicast group of all of my link local neighbors. Every single interface, wireless, if you've got any tunneling mechanism, your actual network interfaces, they've all got that multicast group that would, be, that would exist and be valid. You do often need to specify what interface you're going out of. So the first tool, just going alphabetically, is Adder 6, an IPv6 address analysis and manipulation tool. I didn't see a ton of manipulation in there, but Adder 6, dash A, pick an address, dash D for decode. Decode that IPv6 address. Probably my favorite website for doing that is v6decode.com. 
You can hover over the bytes and it'll tell you things about them. I like that website. There's also Tavian, it's a Perl script. You can download it if you want to run it locally, or I've always just used it there. Or you can install IPv6 calc. Command line tool for Unix. I've built it for a number of different targets. Nice, simple, easy. Pick one that you like and use it. So I saw a lot of alternatives to Adder 6, but this one doesn't involve flooding my network, so I'm perfectly happy to try it. So I throw in an Adder 6, blah, blah. I threw in the slash 64 just out of habit. I'm used to doing it that way. And it barked at me. Address not valid. I say, oh, maybe it didn't want the net mask in there. So I try it again without the net mask. And it tells me that this is the IP address for Moose. You can look it up in dnsmoose.net.unc.edu. It's unicast, global, global, low byte, and unspecified. It's not looking, you know. So then I threw in Moose's link local address, and it comes back and says, this is unicast. It specifies one machine, not a group of machines with multicast. It is link local, so it's on the link, IEEE derived, and then it's giving me the OUI. Anyone recognize that OUI? Yes, yeah, the first three bytes of the MAC address. That OUI is VMware. So I look at that and go, yep, I'm running it on a VM. I know this. OK, so the first tool wasn't so scary. Let's move on to the next one. I go, oh, flow labels. One of the interesting things about IPv6, it adds a flow label to every packet. And this, instead of having to do tricks on your router, should you decide to turn on something like quality of service, if you're messing with the net flow, no, the flow identifies itself in IPv6. This is part of the same flow, the same conversation that's going on. It's self-identifying, which is wicked cool, actually. Yes? The client defines the flow, correct? Yes. Yes. But there are interesting things I can do with that. Do I trust it? Do I not? Would you run this in a production network? Probably not. No. <laughs> and I tend to rate limit what I spend. Yeah, I tend to rate limit anything that gets a fast path. You get a fast path for a small volume. Yes. What's that? Oh. Uh, the. Yep. Oh, the first quest, first comment was flow labels are just ripe for manipulation. Yes, I tend not to trust anything that the user tags. In fact, if they set the diff serve code point, the very first thing I do is strip that. Uh, the next comment. I'm sorry, I've already forgotten. Um, do you use it to put things on the fast path? Uh, use the flow label to put things on the fast path. And my follow up is, and I always rate limit that. You know, what do I reasonably expect? If you do more than that, something's gone wrong, throw an alert. So this assesses the flow label generation policy of whatever you're probing, the dash D destination. For TCP by default, you can change that with the dash capital P option. On port 80, by default, you can change that with the dash lowercase p option. And I went, I don't have anything that's really doing much over there. I suppose I should have probed itself for that. Fragment flood. This is where I started going, I don't really want to flood the network that happens to have all of my servers in it. That, that just doesn't seem like a good idea. To me. So FRAG6 is a tool to perform IPv6 fragmentation-based attacks and to perform a security assessment of a number of fragmentation-related aspects. One of the interesting things I learned while we were just during our firewall RFP was um, firewalls don't necessarily treat fragments the same way as they treat the first packet. And that just terrified me. If you drop the first packet, drop all the rest of them, OK? And to understand that sometimes fragments got through when the first packet didn't terrifies me. So this is something 
I want whoever's evaluating the firewall to check. So let's see. Here's where you check it for the ID policy. This dash capital F is the flag to send a flood of fragments and see if the firewall that you're testing stands up to it or not. You can also see if the host you're sending this to falls down when it gets a whole bunch of fragments that it is going to attempt to reassemble, but hey, we're doing this maliciously and there's nothing to reassemble to. Uh, those are the sort of things that firewalls and hosts should discard out of hand without thinking. And I think we're all going to hold our breath waiting for that to happen. Ah, now we get into our friend ICMP v6. The ICMP6 is a tool to perform attacks based on ICMP v6 error messages. All of the ICMP error message rules are true. You're not to send an error in response to an error. You're not to send it to an address other than a unicast address. Unless, of course, you have a tool like this where you can break the rules. So for instance, you could send the error ICMP6 packet too big. Remember the path MTU I was talking about? She can throw back a, yeah, I don't like your MTU. Using ICMP6, send it to a destination. You can make up what address you want to use here for the source. And then you can say what MTU you're advertising and throw it into verbose mode to look at it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to watch any of my hosts fall down. This, this is where we get into my, I'm glad I work with a good security group. And they can tell me the horror stories of this brand of firewall that we didn't buy, whitelists every piece of IPv6 coming in. And I go, what? And they say, and this brand sends all the fragments through, even if it dropped the first packet. And I go, what? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Um, I also think they do that just to watch me yelp because I will actively respond to the things they're saying. I don't fall asleep while they're talking about this testing. Oh, wait, I didn't cover Jumbo. We'll go back to Jumbo 6, a tool to assess potential flaws in the handling of IPv6 Jumbo grams. We have the source, destination, and you pick a payload size. It's actually pretty cool if you want to test Jumbo packets. Well, it depends. I want them on my local area network for a number of things. My storage area network loves Jumbo grams. Yes. So his comment is correct. Jumbo grams were originally designed for shared memory and shared storage VMs. That said, our storage area network loves Jumbo grams, performs much better. The interesting thing is uh, Jumbos are becoming more useful. You can decide whether that's good or bad. As the link speeds are getting faster, this isn't an IPv6 issue. When you go to 10 gig, if you don't bump up your default window size, you can end up with a 10 gig server that maxes out in throughput testing at around 4 gigabits per second. And you grumble and you say, why did I buy this shiny new NIC? And if you're like me, you do your first iteration of, well, the network card is so new, they haven't gotten that good at writing the drivers for it. And you go along for a minute and you think you're right, because this used to be true in the past. And then you go, no, something still smells wrong. Because you usually get about 60% when it's bad firmware, not 40%. And you go do a little more digging. And uh, it's at the switch.ch website. You can see the impact of TCP window size on maximum throughput. So we have a large number of NDT servers, network diagnostics testing, on campus for users to see how their throughput's going. We have a number of them with 10 gig cards. We had to bump up the window size seriously to see the t full 10 gig throughput on these. So jumbo grams as an IPv6 thing, meh. 
being able to test that because we're going to want that for servers soon, yeah, I'm all on board with that. So send a jumbo frame. Well, at this point, when we start talking about jumbo frames, I start thinking about using Scapey. Build my jumbo packet from there. That's, that's a packet building tool. I like it for that. Neighbor advertisements, getting down into the NDP. So we can send arbitrary neighbor advertisement messages, target destination interface, send, we can flood. Yeah, I don't want to flood my server network. Sorry, but I like my servers. Node information. This is again in ICMP v6 to send arbitrary node information messages and to look for potential flaws. The thing about the shiny new protocol is no one has carefully thought through all the ways you can make it blow up. Well, no. The protocol designers haven't thought about that. The developers haven't thought about that. The hackers probably have. Being able to test this would be nice. OK, we also have the neighbor solicitation flood. So we can send arbitrary messages that say, hey, tell me if you're a neighbor. Hmm, that, that sounds like we could get into another flood like I was talking about, new Windows boxes with the Intel NIC and a million times a second. I, yeah, this one scares me. So it's saying do a flood of 100 packets every five seconds and you can tweak that one. I didn't want to flood my nice little network. Sorry. Router advertisements. This one really can bite you. Actually, I'm going to do a time check right now. I'm going to speed up a little bit through the tools that I went, ew, I'm not putting that on my nice pretty network. Tool to send arbitrary router advertisements. Uh, you can send things like, you need to get your information from DHCP v6. What if you send a fake router advertisement that says, get your information from DHCP v6 that includes a v6 server that, say, I didn't build, someone else built? Yeah, I don't want anybody else doing that. You know, if there is one true DHCP server, I run it. I don't want rogues. We scan for rogues regularly. This would make it far too easy to escape detection on just a link local somewhere over there. And if it's link local in a VLAN where we don't have v6 enabled, I'm not even going to reach it or be able to hear it from my console. This does not thrill me. A tool to send arbitrary ICMP v6 redirect messages. Can you say man in the middle attack? Oh, and you can do it as a flood, as if that weren't fun enough. A tool to send arbitrary router solicitation messages. I don't know. I think sending that every microsecond might crash the router. Didn't feel like trying that. Ah, we get to their local segment scan. This is probably going to be similar to the IPv6 mod in terms of scanning for addresses. So you do scan 6, you pick an interface, dash L to list it. Or one of the things when I teach my class on IPv6 is I say, we've all heard, you know, pull out your phone. You want to do something on your phone. There's an app for that. Well, when it comes to IPv6, I want you to learn to say, there's a multicast group for that. Nice, simple. And once you start thinking that way, it's true. The first time I went to set up our DHCP v6 server, I just went through all of our v4 options, tacked a 6 in the place where it was tacked everywhere else. Turns out, if you try to send the NTP server over DHCP v6, you will crash your own ISC DHCP v6 server. And I'm beating my head against the wall. Why can't I set the NTP server? I do it everywhere else. The reason why, there is a multicast group for that. You don't need to get it from DHCP when you can just multicast for it. I think I disagree with that. Yes? IPv6 and Android. <laughs> I've heard that Android handles it horribly. Yes. And that it, it strongly prefers router announcements. When it bothers to listen to them. Uh, the question was about IPv6 and Android. 
And the correct answer is to start laughing in somebody's face. Some Android phones support it very well on the radio, the cellular side, T-Mobile. You get a new T-Mobile phone, it's doing V6 fantastically. Android on the Wi-Fi ignores, well, uh, yes, appears to ignore a lot of router advertisements, uh, just puts the V6 stack to sleep randomly while still keeping the V4 stack running. Um, they have a lot of bugs that have been open for a long time, and there was a rather snarky, well, patch is welcome that came out about six months ago, and such a patch was recently submitted and rejected. And it was rather nicely written, in my opinion. The comment is, I point at Android for how to do corporate open source wrong. I think that's a far nicer way to put it than I would have. <laughs> I'm not very good at finding the euphemism. So thank you for the euphemism. I agree wholeheartedly. So being me, I try scan six and got a lot of results. So I just counted them, word count dash line. I got, 60, or I got 75 lines from scan six. And I noticed almost all of them were link local. Link local addresses start with FE80. So I go, hmm. So how many of them were link local where the address started with FE80? So grep for that, count again. 67 out of 75 were link local. The remaining eight came back with their global unicast address, the 2610, 28, 3090, same thing that Moose is in. But then I said, you know, there is a multicast group for that. Again, I want you to get used to saying V6, there's a multicast group for that. Well, the multicast group is FF02 colon colon 1. This is all neighbors, this is link local. So link local, all neighbors, and because that could apply to any of the interfaces on Moose, I have to specify that it's ETH1. Interesting thing, I tell it it has to send two packets. And I grep for FE80. It turns out they're all in FE80. When I send two packets, blah, 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 we jump, I cut out a huge amount. You come down here, two packets transmitted, two received. 73 duplicates. What that means is 74 neighbors answered my ping of link local. So I got 75 from the scan six tool, but only 67 of them were link local. Whereas when I used ping six, I got 74 link local answering. So this is a case where you want more than one tool to do the job because they don't all give you the same answer. In a perfect world, they would. They don't. So why did I do ping for a count of two packets? Well, if I send one packet, ping exits after it gets the first response. I actually want to get, I tell it it has to send two packets, and then it gets all of those duplicates. I also wonder if I ran it for more than two packets. Maybe some of the hosts were very slow replying. What if I told it to send three or five and then filtered for the unique addresses I got? This is going to be experience. We, we will all learn this. I don't know the answer. I usually put in two or three right now. So again, doing an actual scan, what I get is I'm seeing 64 bytes from first host those are VMware MAC addresses, so they're likely on the same VM master. What I got at the end of this line that has scrolled off the side is in parens, capital letters, dupe, and a bang, to let you know these are duplicates. In this case, that's actually what I want to see. I want all of my duplicates. We have a tool to send arbitrary TCP segments. Um, that sounds a lot like Scapy again. Pick whichever one is easiest for you to use. 
This is where I wanted to get. Toolkits compared. Dang it, scrolled off the screen. So if you liked Adder 6 in the IPv6 toolkit, if you wanted an alternative, there was IPv6 calc. For the ICMP6 tool, in the hacker's choice one, we had THC ping 6. Neighbor advertisement, there was flood advertise 6. Neighbor solicitation, there was parasite 6 and send piece 6. This is where it does the cryptographic because IPsec, IP security, is built in. This picks a nasty cryptographic hash, so you spike the CPU on the receiver trying to calculate this. Uh, certainly when I looked at the things, so this is the router advertisement 6 toolkit, flood router 6, fake advertiser 6. These looked a lot more um, malicious. Another reason why I installed the one that I did and still went, I don't want to run these. So apologies for being a scaredy cat about this, but I built this nice network. I don't want to sink it. So what have I actually seen? To me, this is the interesting part. What have I actually seen? I have seen rogue router advertisements. Anybody remember Microsoft Windows XP? The uh, home edition would come up with this lovely thing called Network Bridge that if you put it on an enterprise network like UNC's, it would try to bridge wired and wireless, and suddenly you have this loop, and things were very bad. We learned how to block that one very quickly. Well, IPv6 is, again, considered often an island, and certain versions of Windows, uh, most of them made overseas from what I can tell, come up and say, oh, I'll advertise myself as a v6 router and translate from link local to out there, but it's t telling all the other hosts on its VLAN, I'll route your, oops, better not do that, I'll route your v6 for you. And yeah, that doesn't work if you actually have a router on that VLAN working. The feature when Cisco sells it, the feature we needed for network bridge was BPDU guard. The feature for IPv6 is called RA guard, router advertisement guard. This is something we will need. Only Cisco has it right now, and we don't connect users to routers. This sucks. Um, I've seen the neighbor detection flood. That was the uh, new Windows machines that I was talking about. It's a bug in the Intel firmware. So I've seen the neighbor detection floods. That was the million times per second. And I've seen what could have been a router advertisement flood. It went away before I could characterize it. So those are the ones that I'm actually worried about. And then on the network layer, what have I seen break my v6? We didn't finish configuring OSPF v3 for IPv6. Yeah, if you're not passing your routing information, life is bad. I've seen timeouts or silent failures or inconsistency between platforms when the v6 address has gone down and the v4 hasn't. For a while, I had the misfortune of also having some Solaris servers. They would randomly turn off, lose their IPv6 address which when they're also your name servers that you've published with both v4 and v6, this is a bad thing. And you get inconsistent behavior on the client platforms, either the timeout or the silent failure or big error message failure or inconsistent. Yes, sir? Um, one vulnerability related to the top one is, is if you bury your hand, head in the sand with IPv6, you can get bit by the router advertisement. All yes. It takes is someone on your network to become router advertisement and then tunnel that traffic off to first yes. router. Yes. What he said is you're still vulnerable to rogue router advertisements even with no V6. They will tunnel your traffic out. It's not going through your firewall, your analysis. Not really tunneling out, but tunneling back in. <laughs> you may want to block some aspects of V6 before you turn it on. Um, we have hit the wall of time, and we got to the best part. It's out there. The names have changed, but the concepts remain the same. There's some good tools. We've got a lab here. We've got a table in the expo area. Right table. Woohoo! And there's your URL. flyingpenguintech.org slash slide slash self 2014 IPv6 security. If you go to the flyingpenguintech.org homepage right now, click on resources, click on slides, it'll bring you right here.
so everything becomes clickable and usable. We're out of time, but yes, Nancy? Yes. Nope. It, it's literally a welcome to IPv6 where we step through things where I train everybody to say, there's a multicast group for that. I got a question, not related yeah. to security. Um, what percent of your end users have um, dual, are dual stack at, at the university? Okay, the question is, what percent of our end users are dual stack at the university? I'm not sure offhand in terms of who has it enabled for link local, but everything newer is shipping with IPv6 turned on by default. What percentage of traffic is V6? What percentage of our traffic is V6? I do know the answer to that. This is from my network management hat and having NetFlow tools. And the answer to that is a disturbing like one half of 1%. This is because we only turn V6 on in VLANs where we trust the users. So networking, security, ITS, computer science promised to behave themselves if we would turn it on, um, bioinformatics, and iBiblia. Google, I think they're running somewhere between 8 and 10% V6. I completely agree with you. We're not allowed to roll out more IPv6 until we can secure it. And I said, well, if that's your problem, I'll go start learning about this. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, if you want high numbers, just send all your Facebook accounts and Gmail accounts. Yes, we've looked at what part of our traffic is V6 eligible, and more than 50% goes to V6 hosts. If we turned it on in ResNet, at least 50% of our traffic would be V6. And say legacy. Say legacy. <laughs> for IPv4 yes, I'm totally with you. IPv6 is the new IP. It is. We just have to get used to it. And that's why I keep coming out and giving these talks. And why I have a lab where you can plug in anything and we'll see if it goes or not. And if it's Android, it's not. <laughs> and once again, I've hit the wall of time and smashed through. <laughs> Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.